question for you. Okay, I understood. Okay, so first and foremost, I'd like to thank um, the CRB Institute for Advanced Studies for uh, inviting me. I'd like to thank Flora Kukyu for her invitation and warm welcome. And I'd like also to extend my thanks to Francesca Rondina and Jacques Fragoso, as well as um, Nassim Heider uh, for making sure that this presentation is going smoothly. So all my thanks. Um, when I was invited to give this guest lecture, um, I, I was a bit worried because I checked uh, who are the fellows and I was wondering how can I connect these people in fields that are different from mine and especially with people who are not scholars in the humanities. So I first thought that maybe what would be a way of bridging the gap that is currently uh, between the, the STEM uh, fields and the humanities, that analogy would be maybe a good um, a, a, a good point at the intersection between all those fields. Uh, why? Because analogies are still used in, um, of course, it's used in literature, um, but it's also used commonly in the standard French and standard English, but as well as in science and special discursive sciences. So that's why I chose this topic, so that maybe you'll find something in common with plant science in, eight, in the 18th century. Okay. So, um, well, maybe I should go back to the, to the first title. So the title of my presentation is Plants as Machines, Behinds or Corals, Analogies in 18th Century Plant Science. And I would say that the guiding principle uh, of this presentation is a question uh, regarding plants and re um, about the fact that whether they are considered individuals or not individuals. And this is the main question, individuality or individuality. This is an elogism of plants. And why is there such a question? Well, if you look at a, at a cat, you can see that there's a head, a tail, uh, and, and legs and so forth, hopefully. Uh, but if you, if you look at a plant, uh, plants have many ways of propagating without um, uh, pollinization, fertilization. And I give here a few examples. Uh, first would be the, the garlic bulbils, you know, when you, you, when you cook. Um, also the strawberry runners. And it's a way of cloning an individual. And those tree suckers that are uh, shoots that grow from uh, the roots of a plant or a tree. And my favorite, the liverwort propagules. I mean, this is very cool. So like you can see the liverwort here is preparing ready-made clones in little baskets so that it may multiply, uh, clone itself. Uh, I mean, um, those plants are usually very neglected because they don't have flowers, but I think they are the coolest plants on earth. This is my um, humble opinion. So basically with plants, you have this issue that a plant can multiply itself without fruits, without seeds, and it can clone itself. And therefore it's challenging or commonly held notion of individuality. So back now to the, this main theme. And um, I uh, first, I'd like to um, circumscribe a bit better the idea of analogy. So I put a few uh, images here that you may recognize a few analogies in standard um, language. So um, I don't know if some of you can recognize something. Uh, is there anything that you can see that you recognize? And okay, so for instance, um, the one with the tree, what is it? Yes, a family tree. In itself, the family tree is an analogy. 
Okay. Um, what else? Do you recognize anything? Okay, so that not the nerves are the veins, but you're almost there. This is the vascular tree. Okay, so it looks like a tree and this magnificent illustration from the uh, encyclopedia. And then you have also, um, I wanted to, to, to use, this is a shuttle. And of course, I use sort of the space shuttle. And another one, this is the genetic code and uh, treating the ADN as, as if it were um, um, a written language. And then you have a dynamic ecosystem. And the analogy is when ecosystem is used in economics, um, which is, uh, in my opinion, is well, <laughs> not to be done. So this is, so I found a few other analogies, organ, because in Greek, organ means tool, organon. Uh, the web, of course, with that spiders, and the head of state, for instance, which is a very ancient analogy. So that would be a few examples of uh, analogies. Also, there's analogies based on function and others based on morphology. Uh, the vascular tree is, is maybe uh, based on morphology, but the, the sap is circulating, moving within a tree the same way, or more or less the same way, that blood is circulating in the human body and other animals. Uh, so now um, let's go to the uh, 18th century. So here um, I'm giving you the um, definition of the word analogy uh, of the Encyclopédie, um, published, the following one was published in 1751. Um, analogie signifie donc la relation, le rapport, la proportion, the proportion, que plusieurs choses ont les unes avec les autres, quoique d'ailleurs différentes par des qualités qui leur sont propres. Ainsi, le pied de foot de montagne a quelque chose d'analogue avec celui d'un animal, quoique ce sont deux choses très différentes. Uh, and I'm giving you some uh, quickly done translation at the bottom. Il y a de l'analogie entre les êtres qui ont entre eux certains rapports de ressemblance, par exemple, entre les animaux et les plantes, mais l'analogie est bien plus grande entre les espèces de certains animaux avec d'autres espèces. Il y a aussi de l'analogie entre les métaux et les végétaux. So we don't need to keep all the elements that are supplied in these quotations, but first, it's a rapport, it's a relation, it's a proportion, it's a ratio, and also is based, at least in the 18th century, on resemblance. So, such as the vascular tree. But you see, the encyclopedia represented the vascular tree like a tree. Okay. Um, so, in the 18th century, friends, there are different, different types of analogies. Okay, we need to, to be a bit more subtle here. What I would call uh, a discursive analogy in the way that it's um, a matrix of metaphors, sometimes an argumentative discourse. Um, and I would say that the, the analogy of plant as animals is one of the examples, and I will develop further down on uh, this presentation. The instrumental analogy in a technical sense, and I'd like to give you an example. For instance, the botanist Duhamel du Monceau studied the growth of tree branches in comparison with the growth of bones in the body. Okay, so in this case, in the, uh, uh, the instrumental analogy, the, the field of research is circumscribed, is limited, and there is a um, hypothesis that is asked at the beginning of the um, investigation. And then there is the universal analogy called also the analogism or the doctrines of signatures. And then if you're familiar with Michel Foucault, I can refer you to a specific volume in Le Mots et les Choses or the order of things in, in English. And this is the, the doctrine of signature is something uh, quite interesting, and there are some uh, remnants of this doctrine 
in the name of plants, for instance. Um, you have plants that look like, because the leaf looks like something, then it's like the hepatic, okay, that we first saw on the first slide, on the second slide, the leaf looks like the liver, so it's called the liver wort, and it was said to be good for curing liver disease, okay, so just to give you an idea of the doctrine of signatures. Uh, it's still prevalent today if you hear someone who says, oh, I'll, I need to some red meat uh, to get better. Um, it's not only because there's iron in blood, but also because, you know, eating red meat will make you stronger. Um, okay, so this is now, let's go into the first analogy, plants as machines. So um, this is the list of uh, the authors that I will quote. And this is uh, the Dramatis Personae, the, the people uh, who I will mention in the next few slides. Uh, since you may not be familiar with them, I'm just giving you their names, uh, their dates. They, um, they are listed in the order of appearance and not uh, chronologically. Um, so Fontenelle, first a physician, mathematician, historian of science. Uh, because you wrote all the, um, the proceedings of the Academy of Sciences. And um, at, the, at the end, I also put like the big philosoph philosophical movements they, they illustrate, like mechanism, skepticism. Uh, plus, as you can see, he was in his time a popular science writer, uh, the author of a book uh, entitled The Spectacle of, of Nature. And I will mention him. So he's a proponent of physical theology in the way that God is, um, is present in the creation with a capital C in nature. And that, um, um, that all nature is a material evidence of the existence of divine. Uh, divine will, if you want. Um, Balivi, the Italian, is a um, um, an excellent uh, example of iatro mechanism. So it's one mechanism, which means the analogy with um, machines uh, was, was the guiding principle of medicine. And Rogno, another popular science writer, Le Laurent de Valmont, he was a compiler. He compile and compile and compile and was at a, um, a gardening treatise that was um, very well known uh, at the time. And uh, Bernardin de Saint Pierre, so much later in the century. And uh, I just gave a short example. So you don't need to remember everything. I just wanted to give you um, some kind of um, mapping of uh, the people that I will mention in the next few slides. Okay. So the analogy of plant as machine is based first and foremost on the analogy that the world is a machine. The, the nature is a machine because nature is a spectacle uh, arranged by um, di um, divine providence. And uh, all, all you can see is a big decor, but behind backstage, you have machines that are creating those effects. Um, so first, uh, the a, a famous quotation uh, by Fontenelle. Sur cela, je me figure toujours que la nature est un grand spectacle, donc a big, grand show, qui ressemble à celui de l'opéra, that looks like the show at the opera. Du lieu où vous êtes, À l'opéra, vous ne voyez pas le théâtre tout à fait comme il est parce qu'on a disposé les décorations et les machines pour faire de loin un effet, un effet agréable. Et on cache à votre vue ces roues et ces contrepoids qui font tous les mouvements. OK? So, even if you're not familiar with French, you can see that uh, all you can see are the effects the special effects, and behind there are some machines that are creating those effects, and you don't see them. 
but maybe there is someone, a physicist, that will question those effects and will try to seek what's going on um, backstage. And this is what he says. Aussi, ne vous embarrassez-vous guère de deviner comment tout cela joue. Il y a peut-être quelques machinistes cachés dans le parterre qui s'inquiètent d'un vol qui lui aura paru extraordinaire et qui veut absolument démêler comment ce vol a été exécuté. From Plinch, you can hear another um, a, a totally um, different point of view because when he says, he says, this is, um, the show is for us, the spectacle is for us, but we shouldn't try to understand what's going on backstage. Okay. Uh, in the palace necessaire, and this is the, the quotation that I highlighted in red at the, at the end of the quotation, in the palace necessaire de demander que la salle des machines soit ouverte. And Plush, as I told you, is a proponent of uh, natural theology, and therefore this is not something we should seek to understand. We should just be happy because the world has been creating for has been created for us. So that's enough. We should be just content. Um, and then I give you another uh, quotation from Uno, who wrote, uh, who, who was a physician and who wrote um, uh, a, a, a sci-fi novel um, in the 18th century. And you can see the words that he uses, tourbillon, cordage, fouli, levier, machine. This is uh, a technological um, um, vocabulary. Um, ropes, um, really, I forgot how you say that in English, but uh, machines, uh, swirls of dust and air. Um, this is exactly an illustration of the Cartesian physics. And um, also it's totally um, with that life, only machines. So according to this general analogy, you can see also that bodies are, auto are automata. And I'm giving you like a very interesting quote from um, um, Balivi, uh, the Italian um, physician, who says, okay, the, not only the world, but also the human body is a machine. And he says, examine avec quelque attention l'économie physique de l'homme, Où trouvez-vous les mâchoires armées de dents? So, teeth. Uh, Qu'est-ce qu'autre chose que des tenailles? Pincers. L'estomac n'est qu'une cornée. Le stomach is only a retort. Les veines, les artères, le système anti des vaisseaux, ce sont des tubes hydrauliques. Hein? Hydraulic tubes. Le cœur est un ressort. The heart is a spring. Les viscères ne sont que des filtres, des cribles, uh, filters, sieves. Le poumon n'est qu'un soufflet. Et enfin, qu'est-ce que le muscle, sinon les cordes? Okay. So the entire body is made of our technical parts. So according to this um, me me mechanism, this worldview um, as, um, um, of the human body and of plants as machines, of course, you can see that plants also are only machines. La plante n'est qu'un paquet de fibres, a bundle of fibers, of vessels without any action. A plant is nothing else other than many little tubes, okay? And the mechanic or the structure of the plant is si composée, etc. Quel prodige? And the, the character of Uno sees a sap circulating in trees and he compares it with Petite vis d'Archimède. So another uh, mechanical uh, analogy. I'd like you also to um, notice that the, the wording is always which means in English is only, because the, 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 the mechanism has this ambition to reveal uh, what it's hidden and also to reduce extremely sophisticated um, actions and properties to just very simple mechanical movements. But there are some questions and objections to the analogy of plant as a machine. 
The first question is life. Okay. If you follow um, the, the, the mechanistic analogy, then what's the difference between a corpse and a, and a living being? Right? I mean, they are exactly the same. But they can be reduced to, the, to the exactly the same. And also, you may dismantle the machine. But if you dismantle a human body, someone, then the person is dead. Okay? So that was one of the main objections. The second objection is pertaining to the soul or agency. And do plant do something? Okay, so that was a, a, another big challenge to the analogy. And the main challenge was brought by the question of reproduction. And Fontenelle, as usual, you know, very keen. So, well, if you put a, a machine dog and a machine beach next to one another, maybe there will be a puppy. But if you put a clock next to another clock, never you will end up having a third clock. Okay? It's a, I mean, and this is exactly the point. And I am quoting also Bernadette Saint-Pierre, who late in the century uh, repeated his main objection to, um, um, to mecha mechanism. is like, well, if you pull, if you, if you, if you plant some um, cuttings of willow, then you may end up with new trees, but not so with hydraulic pumps. Okay, so that was really like the main objection. So therefore, during the 18th century, and I'm simplifying here for the sake also of this presentation that doesn't last 12 hours. Um, the analogy of plant as machines was replaced by another very powerful analogy, plant as animals. Okay, to 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 in order to include the main objections such as life, agency, and reproduction. So here is the list of sources: the Encyclopédie, again, niche, <laughs> uh, from we met before. Sébastien Vaillant, the botanist who provided evidence of plant sexual reproduction. Gilles Augustin Bazin, a physician um, who studied with Réunion and who was famous for his um, uh, study of bees. And again, Fontenelle, because um, he's always asking the right questions. So um, in the Encyclopédie, um, you can see that the, the, the analogy of uh, with animals was now the main idea. Uh, par les observations de Malpighi, du Dr. Green, de Monsieur René and Bradley et d'autres auteurs, il paraît, it seems, like the mechanism of plants is very much alike to that of animals. Les parties des plants semblent avoir une analogie constante avec les parties des corps animés animated bodies, et l'économie végétale paraît formée, formée sur le modèle de l'économie animale. And you can see the prudently phrased definition seems to be, because they are not so sure, but this is uh, the new idea, that plants may be, are not animals, but they are made the same way as animals. Okay. So now you can see how the analogy with animals can also produce many sub-analogies. And I'm quoting Plush. Okay, so if you look at a plant, where's the stomach? Where is the skin? Where is the heart? Okay, so because if it's a, a functional analogy, then they should be the same. La racine sert d'estomac à la plante pour digérer la nourriture. L'écorce est la peau de skin qui couvre tous les vaisseaux. La tige est le corps de l'animal. Et la sève qui monte de la racine aux branches, puis revient des branches à la racine, ressemble parfaitement au sang qui circule dans le corps des animaux. Well, is it that easy, though? Okay. Um, but we, I'll, I'll go there. So this is a very ancient analogy, but it was reactivated in the 18th century by the discovery of sexual reproduction. Once it was understood that plants would reproduce just as animals, 
then maybe plants are some ways are animals. And I'm giving you two quotations by uh, Sébastien Vaillant, uh, with many eroded on the terms. Uh, for the sake of time, I will read only the second one. Mais s'il arrive que sur un même pied de plante, il se rencontre des fleurs qui n'entourent que des organes féminins, et d'autres se trouvent les deux sexes, la tension et le gonflement des organes masculins de celle-ci se fait si subitement que les lobes du bouton, cédant à leur impétuosité, s'écartent ça et là avec une célérité surprenante. Dans cet instant, ces fougueux qui ne semblent, qui semblent ne chercher qu'à satisfaire leur violent transport, ne se sentent plus plutôt libres que faisant brusquement une décharge générale, un tourbillon de poussière qui se répand, porte partout la fécondité. So here it is clear. Um, I hope you understood a bit. I mean, that uh, plant's sexuality is not compared, but confused with human sexuality. And from the works of Sebastian Vaillant, you have the work of Linnaeus, of course, who based the sexual system on the number of stamens and the number of pistils. I'll give you the key on, on, the, on the left side, the key to the Systema Naturae, first published in 1735. And here you can see uh, the manuscript of Preludia Sponsaliarum Plantarum, which means the prelude to the wedding of plants, uh, written in 1729. But there are some limits to the model of an animal model. Because plants have this faculty that animals do not, which is vegetative propagation. This is the propagule that we saw on the second slide of this presentation. And as Bazin declared, les animaux n'ont qu'une seule voix pour produire leur semblable. Les plantes ont une voix analogue à celle des animaux. Et outre cela, besides, un nombre prodigieux de germes fécondés, toujours prêts à éclore, et répandus dans toute la superficie de leur trou et de leur branche. That's why you may multiply plants by cutting, but not, you may not do the same with animals. And also, a plant has the ability to grow into a complete being from a fragment. And this is key, really. And as we say for now, this is mind blowing because you cannot really imagine that from the, the, the leg of an animal, you may grow a heart, lungs, the entire animal. So this, the, vegetative, the vegetative propagation is actually um, undermining the validity of the animal analogy. So the third and last analogy, which is now, um, quite common is plants as communities. And again, I'm giving you the list of sources, and you may notice uh, that now really most of the sources here are from the second part of the 18th century. Okay. So, what gardeners could observe in plants is that the trunks and the branches were covered with seeds or germs, invisible seeds and invisible germs that allowed the tree to duplicate itself. Okay, and this is what Le Lorrain de Valmont says, tout l'arbre make un composé, a compound of seeds, et de germes, d'où il n'est pas impossible de faire naître d'autres arbres. So, you know, they had no idea of the mirror stems, absolutely no idea. So they imagine trees covered with seeds, invisible seeds. What Buffon observed is that, um, he was one of the first to observe this, is that the growth of the tree is like um, a growth of the colony of trees on the tree, okay? And um, that's what he says, um, I highlighted in red, chacun de ces boutons est une semence. 
um, all birds are a seed that uh, holds the little tree of each year. And the, the growth of trees is like a grow of many trees on the tree. And this is something that uh, botanists will notice in the in the seventeen in the nineteen seventies. So the conclusion, and I'm quoting Charles Bonnet, that despite all the analogies, la plante a été construite sur un tout autre modèle. Okay, so this is basically the end of the plant animal analogy that it cannot be. Are confused. It may be compared, but not confused. An arbre is metanto unique. A tree is an individual only in a metaphysical sense. It is actually composed of as many trees and um, bushes uh, as branches and, and stems. So imagine that branches are grafted onto trees. Okay. Um, this is why I'm, th th that is why I'm, you know, I'm giving you the image of a cat and a tree. So the end of the animal plant analogy. Um, so next is let's imagine that trees are like social insects, or plants as bees or beehives, and um, this is. Um, uh, a picture of a swarm of bees. So the next analogies will compare trees to uh, beehives or swarm of bees. Une ruche de vivante, a living beehive. Um, and so Dupont de Nemours is asking the question, uh, a plant, will, is it a family, a republic, some kind of um, alive beehive? And the answer is, Yes. Okay. Um, here I should have highlighted. Um, in a plant, it's a confederation d'animaux, tous parents, tous intimement unis. Okay. All working toward the same goal, which is the growth of the whole tree. So you may be a bit um, surprised to see the, 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 the shift from the, the beehive to re the republic, okay? The analogy of the republic is really ancient. So I'm quoting like Aristotle, Virgil, and then in the, in the early modern period, you have Bertrand, Constant Langlois, Mondeville, of course, the fables of bees, and Pluche again, and Réaumur and Bazin. Okay, so the, 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 the the assimilation of the beehive as a republic was based on the conception of bees as the ideal citizen. Uh, within. So that was the Aristotelian idea. So that's why you have this, um, uh, this shift between the beehive and the republic. But for the sake of time, I will, I will go to the next slide. But here you have Bader and Saint-Pierre comparing uh, a ruler to a republic or to a beehive. Um, next, so the, 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 the analogy will smoothly slide from, from the, 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 the beehive to the republic to the polyp or the freshwater hydra. It occurs in a very specific context, which means the discovery of a polyp by Réaumur and Tremblay, who published the results of the discovery of the Tremblay in 1744. What happened there, it's a major uh, shift uh, in, the, in the animal paradigm because they discovered that the, the freshwater hydra, you could actually multiply it by cuttings, okay? So therefore, you could use the plant analogy to explain the animal kingdom and not the reverse. And I'm quoting Tremblay, non serait-il donc point des polypes? Comme des plantes qui multiplient par rejetons et boutures. So maybe um, you find that the freshwater hydra, the polyp, that is a plant as well as an animal. It's an animal, but it behaves like a plant. 
and again Buffon, uh, who repeats us the same argumentation um, and the same image, ainsi dans les sons de Willows, dans les polypes, comme il y a plus de parties organiques semblables au tout que d'autres parties, chaque morceau de saule ou de polype, qu'on retranche du corps entier, devient un saule ou un polype. So each cutting of a willow, of each cutting of the polype, becomes um, a whole, a, um, an, individual, an individual that is complete. Okay? Uh, and the last quotation is from Dupont de Nemours again, the polype looks like plants because they can propagate by cutting. Um, so now it's really like, uh, I'm, I'm taking you on a trip, you know, an analogical trip from, from, the, from the, the beehives to the republic to the, to the polyp, and now from the polyp to the corals, uh, because the corals were, were confused with polyps. And so I will very quickly, um, for the, the first point, I'm giving you a quotation by Fontenel that corals are compared uh, to a large family, many families living together, like a, um, a nation, an, an, an immense city uh, filled with its inhabitants. And now you have from the food party, uh, which is for the corals, back to the plant. And I just would like to spend a, a little time on the two quotations that you have uh, below. The first quotation states that corals are plants, and that was the position at the beginning of the 18th century. Okay, um, that was the position of uh, Marcilly and repeated by Renaud. Okay, corals are plants. At the end of the 18th century, it's like corals are like plants. Okay, they are not confused with plants anymore, but they develop they grow like plants. Um, today, and in the 19th century, you will, have, you will have many more variations on the plant cause analogy. And I give you a few examples. The first one was written by Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin. And um, as you can see, I highlighted in, in red that trees are compared to a swarm of individual plants. And the wording is very important because, of course, he has in mind the swarm of bees emerged. Okay. And he's ending his quotation by saying that um, the, the plants is growing like the branching cells of the coral insect. So in one quotation, so you have all the analogies coming together. Um, and then you have Fabre in the late uh, 19th century, also who's repeating this, um, uh, this, this similarity, this comparison that a vegetal is comparable to a polypary covered of polyp. But also Francis Allais, the botanist, um, the well known botanist, who uh, based his comparison of the culinary structure of trees to colonies and corals. And lately, in a 2021 book by Corinne Len, who is at the Inrail in Auvergne, um, who uh, wrote this uh, book, Dans la peau d'un arbre, um, also repeated the same uh, analogy. And I'm wondering if she quoted Francis Aleo. It's just, in, you know, somewhere in being conscious that uh, cutting tree and then the image of the fresh water hydra. Couper une branche pour bouturer un arbre, c'est facile. De même, hacher une hydre de rousse repoussera en hydre. Mais couper un, un bras à un homme et vous obtiendrez un homme diminué. Indeed. Conclusions. So, I wonder how this analogy will develop in the future. But I can see now that there are many works targeted for a general audience um, that are playing with this idea of collective, trees as communities, trees as collective beings. Um, 
first, for instance, I'd like to um, mention the book uh, of Suzar Simard, um, who is the uh, arborist and, and botanist in the University of British Columbia, who wrote on the mother tree and who um, um, developed this idea of the wood wide web of the forest. Um, uh, there's also the work of Marc-André Selos, who is uh, currently professor at the museum, and in his book, Jamais Seul, Never Alone, who compared the, the human body to an ecosystem, uh, blinding with life and microbes, and trying to make his point was that we are collective beings already. Our brain may not be aware of it, but our second brain, which is the stomach, is actually... Uh, uh, full of their own life. And then um, as a quotation, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like also to mention the work of Sophie Gerbet, who is at Bordeaux, and who is um, questioning, challenging this idea of mosaicism uh, from the point of view of genetics. And whether we um, trees are individuals, genetically speaking, or they are collective beings. So that would be the three I mean, there are many more, but three current uh, directions that research is actually um, taking um, nowadays. And that would be the short bibliography. And uh, if you have questions, I'd be happy to. Yeah. 